where you know you know people have sort of used robots to do these inspections the census will be very quickly able to tell you so a uh, very interesting that we left it for uh, curing Good evening and welcome everyone. With great pleasure and enthusiasm, we, the SES Club of NIT Raurkela, in collaboration with ICE UK and IT Raurkela chapter, bring you an enlightening session of seminar. This is Abhishek and I'll be your host for today's session of our very informative and encouraging seminar talks. Through seminar, we welcome eminent personalities from different fields of civil engineering for highly intuitional webinars. Our previous sessions were graced by Professor Sriram Narasimhan from University of Waterloo, Canada, Professor Nemi Bhantia from University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, who is also the scientific director of IC Impacts, and Professor Rishi Gupta from University of Victoria, Canada, who gave their insightful talks to our student community. Before we begin our webinar, I would like to call upon Mr. Satyadeep Mahapatra, President of SES Club of NIT Raurkela and Convener of Seminar Organizing Committee for a welcome address. Thank you, Abhishek. Um, Hello, everyone. This is Satyadeep Mahapatra, President of SES Club of NIT Raurkela and Convener of Seminar Organizing Committee. Sevina is an online webinar come talk session organized by SES Club of NIT Raulkilla in collaboration with IC UK NIT Raulkilla chapter, hosted via YouTube Live. The purpose of Sevina is to provide the entire civil engineering community with a diversified platform to gain and share knowledge about certain television topics of current and future interest in the field of civil engineering by noteworthy personalities who have attained expertise in their respective domains. First of all, I welcome Professor Subhajit Mandal, Assistant Professor from Department of Civil Engineering of NIT Raulkela, Chief Patron of the Seminar Organizing Committee and Faculty Advisor of Stage Club of NIT Raulkela. Now I welcome Professor Sanat Nalini Sahu, Assistant Professor from Department of Civil Engineering of NIT Raulkela with specialization in Water Resource Engineering Now, as Abhishek has mentioned, distinguished professor from all around the world has graced our seminar. Adding another feedback to our crown today, we are joined by esteemed professor Chitranjan Ray from the prestigious University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Apart from that, he also heads the Nebraska Water Center. I feel proud and privileged to welcome Professor Ray to today's session. It's quite an honor to have you with us. Last but not the least, I welcome all the audience members. Without your valued and continued support, Sivina would not have flourished. Thank you. Abhishek, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Satyadeep, for the welcome address. Now, I would like to request Professor Subhajit Mandal, Assistant Professor from Department of Civil Engineering, NIT Raurkela, and Chief Patron of Sivinar Organizing Committee, 
to say a few words on today's auspicious event that we are about to witness. Uh, welcome all. Uh, this is Sist uh, Club initiative, and this initiative is basically from the student side. I encourage the student to invite that uh, distinguished faculty and professional uh, to uh, give a talk in our uh, uh, seminar. So seminar is basically civil engineering seminar type thing that is online. I thanks all the students and that SES uh, club member who is working hard to make it a, a successful. I also thanks Professor Rai uh, for today's program. So I also give uh, these thanks to our SES club uh, member, all the members. Okay, and I welcome Professor Rai to give a uh, talk on this research topic. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those encouraging words and the guidance we have from you. Now, I would like to request Professor Sanat Nalini Sahu, Assistant Professor from Department of Civil Engineering of NIT Raurkela, with a specialization in Water Resource Engineering and Hydrology, to give her precious inputs to our audience. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, I welcome all uh, to this uh, session. Uh, this will be delivered by the eminent personality, Professor Chitranjan Roy, on Riverbank filtration. And uh, I look forward uh, uh, look forward for a successful session. And I would like to thank you uh, all, uh, along with Professor Roy, uh, for sharing his knowledge uh, to our students and to our faculties. Thank you. Please enjoy. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your inspiring words now, today. We feel it as a great opportunity and fortune that we are joined by Professor Chitranjan Ray from the highly prestigious University of Nebraska, Lincoln, USA. He is the director of Nebraska Water Center. His achievements and honors include fellow at the American Society of Civil Engineers, elected diplomat in American Academy of Water Resource Engineers, fellow at the Japan Society for Promotion of Science Fellowship, member of the OECD faculty fellowship in the Czech Republic, Germany, and Australia, and a part of Fulbright Senior Scholarship in Nepal, India, Bangladesh. He has also authored two renowned books in the field of hydrology. Currently, he is working on Lane Collector's Well, which is one of the recent developments in the field of water filtration and hydrology. Just a little housekeeping, for our audience before we get started. If you have any questions during the webinar, do type them into the live comment section as there will be a Q&A session followed by this webinar. Now, without further ado, I would like to call upon Professor Ray to begin with his presentation on the topic of riverbank filtration. Thank you very much and uh, it's a lot of uh, <laughs> high sounding words on me, but uh, there is nothing really big about it. It's just a uh, regular work that takes you over life. And so uh, it's not highly prestigious. It's uh, okay in life. You just do your work. So can you see the slides now or uh, I have to do anything on this? It's shared now. The slides are visible, sir. Okay. Yes. Okay, let me start then. So riverbank filtration for a uh, water supply. And as um, you mentioned, uh, I have a co-author here, Matt Reed. He's a project manager and hydrogeologist with Rani Collector Wells in Columbus, Ohio. And this is a low cost water treatment technology. Let me just uh, briefly mention about the outline, what I'll be talking about. Need for water treatment. What is this uh, river bank filtration or uh, traditionally we call it bank filtration? How does it work? How well does it work? And some of the research issues, what we should be looking into. So why you need to treat water? So, you know, we cannot, we don't want to drink water from the stream or lake because it has particulate matter, it might have pathogens. So basically, we need to remove particulate matter and fine colloids. Uh, we want to remove the pathogens, bacteria, viruses, or uh, protozoa. And then we also need to have some removal of test, uh, foul test, or uh, odor causing compounds, color, and other chemicals that are of health concern to humans or animals. 
So in the developing world, um, the World Health Organization guidelines say that there should be 20 to 50 liters of clean water supplied per day for drinking and hygiene. The European Union supplies uh, on an average 140 uh, to 145 liters per day. But the US is a bit high, actually 300 to 380 liters per day supply. Uh, most cities in the developing world lack adequate treatment and supply infrastructure. That's uh, an investment issue. And then <clears throat> most of India, if not all, and many of the developing countries, they uh, deal with intermittent supply, not 24 hour pressurized supply. And then as a result, there are heavy losses in the system. And then introduction of uh, contaminants, uh, especially during the depressurization, once you turn the pump off, the pressure drops. So then the negative pressure is created and it sucks in the outside water into the <clears throat> pipe through perforations if we have any. Then in these intermittent systems, you need on-site storage and treatment, which cost extra money. But water is considered as a human right um, issue. Um, for safe drinking water, you look into the traditional medieval kings we had, they had public uh, places, wells, uh, for travelers going to different places, they were able to drink that water. But of course, things are different now. In, uh, in a country like India or any other place uh, which is still developing, can you get free drinking water as you're traveling or you have to pay for it? In Europe, I don't see really free water supply, but in the US, yes, in most places, uh, in public places, they're mandated to supply clean water to the public free of cost. Uh, but I don't know whether it's really a possibility or not, that's a different thing to look into. But if you look into the supply hours in India, uh, this is a chart, we had a paper actually, the right side, the reference is there. The It's Cornelius Sandhu, the first author. He is in Germany right now. It's in the Clean Technology and Environmental Policy Journal of Springer. Chandigarh had in that 11 uh, survey, uh, the most supply hours, uh, 20, 12 out of 24, Amritsar had a little more. But you know, there are cities with a couple of hours less than that, Bhopal, less than two hours. Visakhapatnam even, yeah, less than two hours. So this is the situation. You have to have some storage system to hold your water and then treat before you drink. So what we need here is technology that is cheaper to treat the water, the source. It has to have adequate amount of water and a reliable source. The infrastructure that's uh, pressurized for a 24 hour supply, but it's um, difficult and also it has to be monitored. With the rising economy, you can see this, these things happen uh, Southeast Asian countries. If you go to Bangkok, you see 24 hour supply. South Korea has gone for a overhead tanks to, especially on the individual buildings to 24 seven, Taiwan, Singapore also same way. So this river bank filtration or a commonly we call bank filtration is helping in a treatment. It's a low cost treatment as well as in a supply because you can get large supplies once you put these systems next to rivers. So how, what is really bank filtration or a river bank or a lake bank filtration? You have to have a source, which is a river or lake and then you have a well on the bank. So as you start pumping, you induce the surface water, you create a cone of depression in the well here, if you can see here. Then the surface water will be induced to flow to the well, same as the groundwater. But what happens that uh, depending upon the hydraulic connection between the <clears throat> river and the aquifer, which is below the river or uh, where the well screens are located. You'll have a portion of the river water flowing to the aquifer and then finally coming to the well and that well is pumping that water out. So many processes occur that physical filtration, biodegradation, adsorption of chemicals to surfaces of uh, colloids or um, organic uh, particles in the aquifer chemical precipitation, redox reaction, and many of these things happen. So it's a mix of a reaction. It's a complicated process to <clears throat> fully mathematically put these together for a solution. So this is what happens and we get uh, at the end, relatively clean water to supply to the public. 
So there are three things we need in the river bank filtration system or a lake bank systems. <clears throat> a good source, a source must be present with a dependable flow. If the river dries out, <clears throat> of course, you cannot get as much water. And the water has to be of a decent quality. It cannot be raw sewage because it's going to have more uh, uh, problems. And there has to be hydraulic connection between the river or the lake and the underlying aquifer. If there is a heavy clay layer, of course, the water cannot leak through that. It has to have somewhat uh, moderately to high permeable um, underlying material. So how these things look like? On the right side, you can see there is a river with a, a small boat going. That is the Rhine River in Germany. And there, is, there are tree, trees in two rows. And between the two rows of trees, there are some wells. These are vertical wells. And they are interconnected through some siphon piping. And then they are pumped. And in the US, they use uh, what is called a collector well. Uh, they dig a large diameter well, maybe about four, five, six meters. And once they come to the desired depth, they put horizontal pipes. And they have a large pump sitting inside. And then they pump it out. So one such well is in Kansas City, Kansas, that can pump up to 1.75 cubic meter per second. Many of them use multiple variable frequency drive pumps. And these horizontal wells are uh, um, limited by local geology. Suppose you have a highly permeable on underlying uh, material below the riverbed, but it is not very deep, then you can go for these types of wells also. And these lateral screens, though, they can be radially distributed in all directions. They can be at multiple levels, or they can be geared more, they can be directed more towards the uh, river. So I can give you some examples. Uh, Sonoma County Water Agency in California, it's the western part of the US. They have, uh, there's a little picture at the bottom you can see on the right side here. Uh, this is a river called a Russian River, the name of the river. So what they do that uh, after they, they get their uh, rainfall, it's like our southern India, winter time they get rain, more rain. Then after the rainy season is over, then the flow in the river um, comes down they put an inflatable dam to raise the water level and they divert part of the water to some of the basins here in the blue color and they have many pumping wells six large diameter collector wells or uh, they can be pumping up to altogether 350 million liters per day and the supply is about uh, for 650,000 to 700,000 people here in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I'm located, it's uh, <clears throat> we have four wells, two installed in uh, 1994 and uh, two in 2014. And these wells are located on an island on the Platte River. They can pump uh, together. First two wells are pumping 1.5 to 1.75 cubic meters per day. Each one had seven lateral screens. They are each um, 22 meters deep. The total length per well, I mean, screen length per well is about 380 meters. And the main pipe where the screens are pushed out, they are about four meters in diameter. And the largest well, there are two of these in Kansas City, uh, Kansas, and the Missouri River. Uh, they are, um, these lateral screens are at two depths. Um, they are about 747 meters long for each of the wells. They are installed in 1997, but their sustained pumping rate is over 1.1 cubic meter per second for each of those two wells. Louisville, Kentucky, uh, in um, the state of Kentucky, Ohio River, they have one of these wells that is uh, it's US 20 million gallons per day or 0.88 cubic meter per second capacity, almost five meter diameter this. Um, when I say case on this is the part here, it has seven lateral screens with 488 meters screen length. And this city of Louisville went back and uh, they decided not to do that type of well because that superstructure, if I go back, you can see this building became an eyesore to the people living on the back side where uh, uh, they did not want such an obstruction of the view of the um, boat or barge traffic going on that river on the other side of the tree. They said, no, everything has to be underground. 
<clears throat> so there are four more wells. So that first well I showed, it's around here, existing well. So they put four wells, but they're all connected by an underground tunnel. And then it comes to a collector system here where there are large pumps to pump it out to the treatment plant here, a green color you can see. So this is the Wire River on the background. And this project got a project of the award from the American Society of Civil Engineers when it was being built. So altogether they can supply five wells now, 60 to 75 million US gallons per day. So this is a mature technology in the US. It's uh, in existence, I would say around World War II. Uh, there are over 375 locations that use uh, riverbank filtration for uh, water supply in the US. How these wells are built, there are, as I said, four to five or six meter diameter. So at the bottom, they create a, like a circular well with RCC and they have these ports where these screens have to be pushed out into the aquifer. And at the bottom, there is a cutting shoe, sharp. And they start this at a flat surface. And then next step, they'll be pouring concrete around that block. And once the cement, uh, concrete is cast, they will use this clamshell to remove the soil from inside and uh, push it slowly, gradually. And they do step by step like that. And as you can see this figure, so it's the first uh, section, 10 to 12 feet. Then the second section is added, third section, this clam bucket is taking the soil out and pushing it down. And once they come to the desired depth, let's say 100 feet or 30 meters or so, they will put a concrete plug at the bottom. And then these uh, round holes are there, what we saw on the first picture, they will be used to push the concrete, I mean, screens into the aquifer. You can see in this here. So there are three types of screens. In the old days, they had a lead cut screens, which have less open area. You don't get uh, open area more than 20%. More common nowadays are these continuous wire wrapped uh, screens. You can have up to 40, 45% open area. And then gravel packed screens, which are uh, used sometimes if you have the aquifer uh, highly heterogeneous. Once you go to the desired depth, you open one of these ports and then you use some uh, blank pipe and uh, try to go to the that video I sent earlier, you'll see a little bit more of that because this will be taking time to show you here. And these uh, pipes are pushed into the aquifer through a hydraulic jacking mechanism. Here the water is coming out and then you have a sump pump that's taking the water out of the caisson so that people can work inside. And you hydraulically push it. Typically you can go to maybe 60 to 75 meters or so. What I was talking about the screens here, these are a <coughs> lathe cut perforated pipes. They, you can have maximum 20% open area. Here are the continuous wire wrapped screens. They are a 40, 45% open area. And so what happens that uh, we decide uh, and there are a couple of design parameters. One is your axial flow through the pipe so that you have less head loss, uh, especially those of you who have studied hydraulics or fluid mechanics, you know what I mean here, a hydro head loss in a pipe or a circular material. And the second is entrance velocity. The entrance velocity has to be small enough through these screens. And there are also gravel or other material that is lodged against these screens. So the actual entrance velocity into the screen has to be in small range so that you don't have further head loss there. Then once you have <clears throat> the screens installed and developed and like you remove the fines and all that, then you have the superstructure built and you have your uh, pumps installed, the controls and all that. And then the, you have to connect to the pipeline. So how these systems look like the picture I showed you before in Germany. So Rhine River here and these uh, dots are on the right bank. They are uh, um, the vertical wells that are collected by the siphon system. They have one horizontal collector well and they are supplying the water to the city of Dusseldorf. The next picture basically showed that again, that picture I showed. 
And this is a tall quiz water work in uh, Dresden, Germany. They have vertical wells and they are kind of li like in this herringbone type structure and they're all connected through a pressurized pipeline to their water works. Uh, what about India? India, we have some locations that are existing bank filtration systems. In Medinipur area, the railway takes its water from the Kansabati River. That is, uh, you know, it's operating for a long time. Railway has been a pioneer in this. But we have uh, uh, places like Dehradun, uh, Srinagar in uh, um, Uttarakhand, uh, Nainital, Rishikesh, and all the many places. Delhi also has uh, river bank filtration systems. Uh, Ahmedabad, Baroda, these are places. I'll show a few pictures later on. Can any of you guess uh, this? This is a uh, Sabarmati River. They, in fact, it has become much more, uh, um, you know, more water now once the Sardar Sarovar project started um, diverting the water from Narmada to Saurashtra area. And this right picture here is uh, Srinagar, Uttarakhand, Alkananda River. We have <coughs> wells um, in Haridwar. Uh, if you recall that where people take bath, this is the Bhimgoda barrage where water comes out. And this is where uh, Harki Powdi, and this is where the um, wells are located. And we have also a few of these wells here. Delhi also has some wells on the Jamuna on the other side here, right embankment. So can we model these uh, river bank filtration systems? Yes, we can. They're a bit uh, difficult. You can do both water quality and quantity modeling. Quantity part we do using mod flow. Quantity, I mean quantity part, yeah, mod flow. Quality using uh, mass transport 3D called MT3D, multi-species MT3D MS. And if we have to look into geochemistry, we have to use Frixi or other geochemistry model. So there is a toolbox called a PhD3D, which can do this. I had a PhD student from Nepal who did this work with a couple of my collaborators in uh, CSIRO in Australia. I can quickly show you what he did. So this is basically modeling the <coughs> river bank filtration system at Dusseldorf. So the river is here on the picture. The high water table is here, uh, so the mean water table and the low water table. Because since this is a navigable river, they maintain certain minimum water level there. And then the quaternary course in sand and gravel, that's what forms the aquifer. And below that, uh, fine sand, which has less flow. The wells are located on the right side here. They have A and B are the monitoring wells and C also monitoring and the production well is in the bit middle. So we'll see the B has some, uh, you know, sampling ports, we'll see. So those a little bit later, one, two, three of those A and B. So using mod flow, you do these layer grids. It's a vertical cross section. The hydraulic conductivity K1, uh, here K1, you can see this is the deposit, river deposit clay, that's low permeability. K2, a little bit better than K1, 10 to the four, minus four meter per second. Then K3, that's the one here. Huh? And that is much better. That's what the produce uh, helps the well produce a lot of water. Then other ones, K6 is also relatively moderate permeability. So once the water goes high, then it can go through the upper part. And the three monitoring ports here, are B1, B2, B3, that's where uh, we'll see some of the model simulation results. And this is the production well. So once the river is at a higher stage, then you can see the travel time to the well is uh, a little bit short. It's about seven to 10 days. You can get the fresh water into the well. Then what happens that uh, short the travel time, then you have a, river water has a lot of oxygen. The oxygenated water is going to come to the well. But once the river level goes down and then it goes through the low permeability bank, it takes more than two months for the river water to reach the well, pumping well. Then what happens in the process that you have many biogeochemical reactions, which removes the oxygen. You go from an oxygenated environment to an oxygen environment where the bacteria are now going to use a nitrate or a nitrogen species for their electron acceptor and they denitrify that. That's how we remove the 
the nitrate in the system. So this is a molar calculation done through modeling that if you look into from day zero is December 31st and day 100 will be like, uh, you know, March, uh, towards March end. So between day 250 to 350 or so, we see that oxygen depletion is happening in the, in the model um, well, the observation wells that B1, B2, B3 we, we showed before. As we get into an anoxic condition, then you see the nitrate is being used as an electron acceptor, N5, that's nitrate. And then now the nitrate, then we see a drop in the nitrate concentration in the molar basis here calculated. So if we have a high nitrate in lake water and, or um, river water, this, make, this um, technology or any river uh, well located on the river bank can really remove some of the nitrate. Let me see some of the performance studies of this river bank filtration system, the one in Louisville, Kentucky. It was monitored over a period of one year. I'm going to show you uh, this well's uh, layout here. It has four, uh, actually seven pipes, L3, L4, and L5, sorry, L3, L4, L5, and L6. These four pipes go towards the river, that's the wire river, flowing from uh, east to west. And then it has uh, two pipes, L2 and L7, they are horizontal to the bank, and one pipe or screen that is L1 that purely gets the groundwater. And we are going to look into the removal of turbidity, organic carbon and bacteria, and uh, some of the other chemicals that are uh, considered health hazards. So the organic carbon, let me go back one second here. This picture here, L4 laterally you are seeing, they put uh, some monitoring stations at two feet, uh, two feet, five feet, and uh, nine feet, uh, two, yeah, two, three, and nine feet below the ground. And they, they took some pore water samples to look at the removal of some of the contaminants. So the total organic carbon in the river varies anywhere from two to four milligram per liter. The more organic carbon you have, there is a more chance that uh, to form uh, uh, trihalomethanes, which are cancer-causing substances, we once you chlorinate the water. And at the pump, you see quite a bit removal of this uh, organic carbon, maybe 30 to 40 percent. So here I look at uh, the monitoring points, two feet five feet and nine feet, we get up to 30% removal within that, actually in the two feet, 30% removal occurring. Then at 50 feet, you are getting up to 40% removal and then more removal as you include other laterals. So what happens that, what is the uh, point of this consideration that uh, the higher organics removed, then you have the potential to remove more uh, um, disinfection byproducts which are formed after chlorination. Then turbidity, turbidity zero, that one NTU or 0 0.5 NTU, that's the drinking water standard. Once the well started pumping, the first two, two three months it was doing some variation because of the vibration, large pumps, settling of the sand grains along the screens. But after that, it pretty much settled around 0 0.1 NTU, that nephelometric turbidity unit. And the river was varying, any, varying anywhere from 10 to 8900. So it's, it was working perfectly. The biodegradable organic matter, they were uh, removed pretty much from, uh, we had about 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. And in, by the time they reached the well screen, they're all gone. So there are about 20% of the total organic carbon is biodegradable organic carbon. So they were decomposed uh, through the river passage, through sorption or biodegradation. So that really leaves less organic carbon to react with chlorine. And this chlorine uh, reaction, what uh, the uh, water utility did, that they did some testing and uh, tried to find out that how much of the water is going to be, um, how much of these um, trihalomethanes, there are three chemicals, trihalomethane formation potential, haloacetic acid, there are six of them, and total organic halogen. These are test formations how much of these chemicals will be removed at a given depth if you take that water and chlorinate. So this is an indirect indicator. You are not removing the chemical, you're taking the water with less organic and chlorinating. 
and then see that what is the um, amount of uh, this chemical you are getting versus when, when you take the river water and uh, chlorinate and uh, look at the same chemicals. So anywhere from 25 to 40% uh, in the first few feet and then at 50 feet we get about half removal. So right now the trihalomethane uh, <clears throat> limit for uh, drinking water is about 60 micrograms per liter. Before uh, this utility was getting about 100 or so and now with this uh, river bank filtration system they don't have to really remove any additional they don't have to deploy any additional treatment systems or a powdered or activated carbon for a trihalomethane removal. What about coliform bacteria? So they get anywhere from 99. Uh, ni 99 is uh, what? 90% is one log removal log 10 basis. 99 is two log. And the four log will be 99.99. This time you guys might have heard about that the masks are removing 99.9% of these bacteria or something. So that means it is removing 99.9% or 99.99% is four log removal. Many of the <clears throat> surface water system, systems in the US, they have to remove uh, four log, 99%, 99.99% protozoa like uh, Giardia and Cryptosporidium. So this well is easily removing three to uh, four log total coliform. Uh, the aerobic spores, the bacillus spores, uh, they were in large number. You don't do the Giardia or uh, Cryptosporidium because they're very small in number. So we see that uh, at 50 feet, you can get easily three log removal of these uh, aerobic bacillus spores. And this really gave the US EPA the data to provide some, uh, they call credit that if you are using riverbank filtration and um, the system is not defined as surface water or a surface water under the direct influence of groundwater, you can supply this uh, water directly to the people, or if you have a filtration plant, you can still claim some uh, filtration credit because of the sand, natural sand filtration you are doing. So these systems also have worked very well in uh, Netherlands. Uh, the Rhine River uh, that comes from Germany that goes through Netherlands. In Netherlands, they call it the sewer of uh, Europe. It used to be like that way. But at uh, 30 days of travel time, which we said in um, the picture I had showed before, uh, it had 60 days. So 30 days, normally they use Germany, and Netherlands, that's uh, require uh, that you have to have a travel time of 30 days from the river to the well. In 30 days, you can get from anywhere from five to eight or seven log removal of uh, um, bacteria viruses or uh, human viruses. So what about chemicals? Uh, in US, normally in uh, months of April, May, uh, when the ground warms up, the farmers apply uh, herbicides to farms, but uh, the runoff water, the rainwater, these things wash off and uh, you can get high concentrations of herbicide in the um, springtime, and that's flooding time. This is Illinois River in Illinois, um, US. It comes from Chicago area and joins the Mississippi River. And it's a two year monitoring study we did when I was in Illinois. And the first year, the concentration of atrazine, which is a pre emergent herbicide, it was about five milligram per liter in the river. But the well, it's a collector well, large well, it showed a pretty low concentration actually, below the detection limit. But in the second year, the concentration in the river water went up to 11 and a half. The drinking water limit for atrazine is three microgram per liter. So basically, if you are using surface water those days, you are exceeding if you happen to a sample. But the well had about 90% removal. So it got about 1.1, 1.2 microgram per liter, which is below the maximum contaminant level. So it works pretty well here. Um, the studies conducted in uh, Dusseldorf, they have seen that this system they have that can remove many classes of pharma um, chemicals, the pharmaceutical compounds, um, chelating agents, aromatic sulfonates, uh, aliphatic amines, many of these compounds, except carbamazepine, which is a chemical that uh, people use for a seizure and other um, medication 
which is they use uh, ogenation and uh, granular activated carbon to remove it if needed. But it's not a regulated compound anyway. So where river bank filtration has been uh, implemented? US, Europe, Vietnam, Russia, South Korea, Malaysia and Philippines, they are talking to us many times. Uh, I don't know if they have anyone or not. Philippines might have one. Egypt along the Nile River, I did some work there. China, Japan, and in limited cases in India, but has huge potential. What are possible other uses? You can use this technology for a seawater filtration for a membrane desalination that has, and there was a company from Singapore which asked me uh, to help them a little bit. Uh, they were putting an alkali plant in uh, Chennai area. Filtration of muddy water for a drip irrigation through infiltration galleries and managed aquifer recharge also, uh, that's possible. You can show how the infiltration galleries can be used at a cheaper cost and uh, they are low producing systems, but that should be okay. With that, uh, what India needs now is basically improved well screen manufacturing with high open area. They can really tap the market if the labor is cheap, the screen should be cheaper. Hydraulic jacking mechanism and boring technology that are affordable, uh, variable frequency dry pumping systems, SCADA um, that you need. High-end consulting firms that have civil mechanical electrical expertise and construction companies that have locally patented technology and trained engineers. So this is a mouthful of things. And with that, I have worked with many places over the years, Illinois State Water Survey, Louisville Water Company, National Water Research Institute in uh, Orange County, California, Professor Thomas Krischak in uh, Dresden University of Technology, and other professors here, uh, John Hopkins, Ed Bauer, Jack Shiven from uh, Netherlands, uh, Jurgen Schubert, he was the chief engineer for Düsseldorf, and Jay Jaspers, uh, he's now the chief engineer for Sonoma County Water Agency. And thank you, I can stop here now and take any questions you have. Thank you, sir, for the insightful talk. That was really an in-depth and informative explanation on the topic. I hope that our audience has been benefited from this session. We will go ahead and take some questions now. Just a reminder for our audience to type your questions into the comment section. So the first question is from Mr. Das. He's asking, India's major rivers are mostly flood prone. During flood situation, are these riverbank filtration technology effective? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, you have to build the system accordingly. In the US, normally most of the systems are built with uh, uh, a 100 year uh, um, above the, the pumps have to be, pump house has to be located uh, uh, above the 100 year flood, but uh, that also did not uh, work in some locations like in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So in some location they go for 500 year flood location. So basically what you have to do that um, you have to have a stable bank, but you have to build a mound or some kind of superstructure and your platform has to be at certain height where the pump and the housing has to be there, where the variable frequency drive pumps or your controls, electrical system, they have to be there. And you have to make provision for the electricity either a buried or a overhead so that they don't get really submerged in water. So those things are there. In fact, uh, I'm looking into some similar questions people have asked me in Sambalpur area or in Sonpur. And, uh, barrage we have, uh, Mundoli barrage. So can it be done really? It's possible. If you go, I have done some of these work in uh, workshops in uh, Hungary, uh, in downstream from the city of uh, Budapest. They have also these mounds where the wells are uh, stationed. I, I can give you guys uh, actually email you when I send the slides, some of these uh, mounds where these systems are located. So our next question is from Soumya. Uh, the question is, what are the necessary conditions to 
to conduct river bank filtration along any river yeah so good question um, the picture i showed in uh, the sabarmati uh, sabarmati river uh, you know it dries out it's not a snow fed river except the gangetic plains and the brahmaputra system we don't have perennial rivers so the rivers have to have some uh, storage structure uh, and then a release um, from that river is going to or from the dam system is going to <clears throat> have some flow Uh, fortunately in conservatory they must have some barrage uh, and the railway gets its water but you have to have a stable bank the bank cannot erode away and also wash away the structure so whether it is a meandering whether you are inside a meander outside the meander or how far from the perennial flow stream you have to consider that you your pipes once they are closer to the screen pipe closer to the uh, river source then uh, you have <clears throat> more flow uh, getting to the um, wells so stable bank a perennial stream and then good hydraulic connection from the bottom of the river to the aquifer where the well is uh, located but you cannot have a you know impermeable stone and uh, you cannot have a bore hole in that to take the water out it's not going to work that way so if you look at uh, indian river systems godavari mahanadi brahmani um, you know even the kali river in karnataka you know it you guys are from many states uh, sabarmati uh, in baroda also they have mahi or uh, forget the name of the river um, ganges jamuna all these rivers have huge potential in fact uh, talcher has a river bank filtration system apparently professor uh, rakesh dash who is in a uh, uh, burla he has done a study and published a paper uh, in the last two years there thank you sir that was a really detailed answer for the question moving to our next question it is from kamalini devi she asks so please uh, is it possible that you can share your idea about the filtration and use to prevent for saline water intrusions yeah there are two ways uh, to control uh, salt water uh, intrusion um when if you pump it, it is it aggravates the situation you have to use it uh, uh, you have to use it as a recharge well to uh, reduce the um storm water i mean uh, sea water intrusion so the sono i mean uh, the orange county water district uh, that's the santa ana river in the west coast of uh, california just south of los angeles they have a series of wells they are recharge wells they run in the rivers so they take the waste water they treat it and they have a plant there called uh, the water factory 21 i think if you guys uh, look up something uh, water factory 21 you'll see that they produce high quality almost drinkable water from a uh, waste water and then they take that water either or recharge the ground water or take it uh, to the sea coast and they have a series of vertical wells they inject it to create a barrier for the sea water to come out and you can do the same thing uh, using these vertical wells or the infiltration gallery where you can recharge uh, the aquifer with the low quality water or a waste water and uh, try to prevent the sea water getting into the land but you should not you, pump sir. you should not pump at the sea shore otherwise you will be inducing more sea water to come to thank you sir a next question is again from mr das he is asking from banks filtration itself four log removal of coliform bacteria takes place or we have to adopt some other methods to remove those pathogenic bacteria yeah so pathogens are a little different than coliform coliforms can be killed by chlorine so chlorine contact will kill their uh, so kill them but the <clears throat> uh, um, the pathogens are uh, uh, when i say pathogen like cryptosporidium and giardia so bacteria viruses they can be easily killed by chlorine or any oxidant or the oxidant cannot kill cryptos cryptosporidium and giardia cryptosporidiums are uh, present typically in 
cow manure from the cow calves and uh, giardia um, animals and all that so these have a cyst around their uh, surface so they are uh, immune to chlorination they will not be easily killed that was the case what happened in milwaukee wisconsin in 1993 that killed 120 people and uh, second about 400000 people <clears throat> because there was a breakthrough of uh, um, these um, cryptosporidium through the sand filtration system so the four log system, uh, removal really occurs if you have a good working filter and the backwash is controlled during the backwash time there is some possibility of some uh, entrapped spores of these um, cryptosporidium or giardia to pass through but you have to have proper mechanism to remove those but for easily bacteria and viruses whether they are pathogenic or non pathogenic you can kill them with chlorine contact any and hopefully it's clear but you can ask again if you are not clear yes sir i believe that was really clear so uh, moving to our next question it's from partha his question is to what extent does pore clogging affect the filtration process how does the model take into account this phenomenon it's a very very interesting question yeah very <laughs> you know mathematically minded person probably so that's in so clogging you know if you have a sand filtration you see the fine particulates clog the sand surface and then you have less filtration takes place the same mechanism really applies to river bank filtration system when you have a uh, flooding going on and the typically the river flow is uh, several meters per second you have a lot of shear force on the surface of the uh, that river bed so fine particles are always washed off but at some intermediate flow time you have a um, renewal mechanism where a deposited rate is uh, same as your uh, scouring rate but at some slow rate you are uh, having more deposits on that what is being washed off so gradually what will happen that you have the reduction in the hydraulic conductivity and those of you who have studied the fluid mechanics uh, well and the hydraulic conductivity is a function of couple of parameters your uh, permeability that the darcy flux is. permeability is uh, dependent upon the size of the particles or the pore size and the second is the viscosity of the fluid so the colder the water the more viscous like between 0 degree and 35 degree you can have more than 200% change in uh, water viscosity so the alakananda river or ganga near haridwar 4 5 6 degree temperature in winter will have less infiltration than summer time and same thing that in a finer bed will have less water passing through so what happens that uh, the slow down of the <clears throat> passage is going to uh, have more so the oxygenated water which gets into the aquifer that will take more time to uh, reach the well so the bacteria which are present in the um, aquifer they will consume the uh, oxygen and uh, gradually look into other uh, energy source like nitrate um, iron manganese sulfate and those things finally it becomes anoxic then you get into you know colored water or smell and other things so that's one thing you have to control in the design calculations and we don't have to worry about that much cold issues in uh, india because uh, you know water viscosity is not going to be a big problem in the um, most part of india uh, so so you have to have certain uh, issues um, and a lot of times what we see that uh, if the deposition occurs then uh, you may <clears throat> see some reduction in the yield but a flooding event occurs which might wash it off but if you put a system in a confined lake or right next to the dam of a barrage which is getting a lot of sedimentation then you will see that your yield is going to decline with time so the siting is going to be an important thing here to do any other questions question on the cyclone Excuse me, I just wanted to ask that question only because uh, 
human integration occurs through the pores of the soil matrix. So that is what I wanted to know. Is there any chance that the pores will be clogged? And the way we are having in our sand filters, uh, we generally go for reverse flow, uh, just to yeah. clean those uh, pores. So is there any mechanism that works in riverbank filtration units also? Uh, so to clean the uh, uh, pores uh, intermittently. So they do two things happen, like uh, in the uh, clogging of the pores at the surface, and clogging of pores can happen uh, deeper in the aquifer through chemical reaction. So surficial clogging is easier to manage because this is a dynamic river that if towards the end of uh, summer, suppose we see. Uh, uh, maybe spring and summer time, uh, early spring and summer time, if we low flow time, we have some deposition. Then we see that um, uh, there is some reduction in the flow. Uh, it will go through that, but once you get in the monsoon time, then that uh, deposited material at the surface will be washed off. Uh, typically, depending upon the, um, the shear velocity and all that. But if the chemical precipitation occurs um, deeper into the aquifer and clogs the pores, then that's where I anticipate more problems to occur. Typically in a, in a system like India, where we, if we have relatively um, close uh, proximity, um, the well screens are in close proximity of the river, I don't anticipate uh, chemical reactions that will cause the calcite or other things to form. Uh, that is a little bit more problematic because, you know, if you have a calcium rich water, then that uh, forms, but that's not the case in Eastern India, South India, maybe in the Western part of um, India, Gujarat uh, or uh, <coughs> Rajasthan, some possibility there, but I don't see really that is an issue. Even in the oil system, I haven't seen that. But main thing is that uh, it needs some uh, <coughs> advice in the beginning, how to cite this properly. Uh, the Mundali barrage, I have been still talking to many people in Odisha. It's not that easy that uh, the driver for uh, getting these things done is not in the hands of the chief engineers or superintending engineers or, uh, or the common people like you and me. It is at the hands of the babus who control the money. And so uh, it, one has to convince the planning commission, one has to convince the secretary of water resources or these people. This is a needy thing. But I've been trying my best uh, through my acquaintances, faculty, and few people who have retired from agencies or a, a young fellow who is working at the, um, the Smart City program of Bhubaneswar, that the 30, ML, 30 MLD treatment plant at uh, Mundoli, Naraj, is not sufficient to meet the needs of the Twin Cities, Katak and Bhubaneswar, and they have a small plant at the Kuakai. So, the right bank or even left bank of uh, Mahanadi just near that Atagod bridge can be used for river bank filtration, but uh, it has to be some distance away from the Mundali weir so that you have some amount of flow going through the river, especially in summertime. Mm -hmm. And those are, uh, and I'm also trying to talk with the Central Groundwater Board folks, and it's still uh, in the midst of discussion. And Dr. Uh, Rakesh Das from uh, um, Burla. Is uh, looking into it, but it is an effort. You cannot uh, <laughs> move into doing so easily, uh, but it's doable. Both uh, Sonpur, um, uh, then the Atagod, Nar Narsingpur, those towns along, or even in you know, Talcher, um, Bhuvan, all those towns, and uh, Brahmani. Even uh, Raukla has probably some potential. You can probably look into your uh, river systems to get that. Uh, so this this is not uh, impossible, but I think it needs some uh, push, and uh, and I don't know what the easy way to convince the bureaucrats that this is doable. So thank you, sir. Okay. So you can take up more questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for the uh, answer. As the time for this session is coming to an end. Sir, do you want to address one more question from the audience? Yes, sure. Okay, so our next question is from Nishant. His question is, East Coast experiences cyclone every year. So do you think riverbank system will be as effective as it is in different places? 
maybe I'll ask the question back. Do you do you think in the context of the structural integrity or the erosion of the bank or or both? But maybe I can uh, go ahead and answer both first and see. Structural integrity is uh, possible because you have to have that superstructure. Uh, it's basically a concrete platform with. Uh, and typically, if you use variable frequency drive pumps, uh, you have to have air conditioning system, but you can control that in a way. And you probably have to shut down the electrical uh, system, uh, probably go through some sort of a mechanism to have the power cut off and uh, all those things uh, taken care of before the cyclone. <clears throat> but uh, the big floods can cut the banks and you have to have some uh, re reinforcement but at the same time, you don't want to completely armor the bank so that you don't have infiltration also. So this needs actually, this is a technology that has developed over the last 75, 80 years in US with close working relationship of three, four groups of people, people, uh, the hydrogeologist or geologist, civil engineers, electrical engineers, and mechanical engineers. So all of them have to work together. So if you, just one expert uh, branch of a uh, specialty cannot really make it happen. Uh, the river Ganga uh, that government is uh, dealing with uh, is mostly polluted. So, so what is your uh, thinking on that? So, what is the hope on that? Yeah. Yeah, so I had a pep actually, it's a little editorial in the science magazine a couple of years back. I'll uh, I will uh, uh, forward that to you. Uh, it was with uh, Dr. Tushar Sah. I don't know if any of you know, he works in uh, International Water Management Institute. Uh, his location is uh, actually in Baroda area. And then uh, Dr. Um, I have another colleague, he was, uh, I'm sorry, it's coming blank to my mind uh, um, right now. So basically that's where we address that the Right now, the main problem of Ganga is because of the uh, diversion of the water, snow, snow melt water in summer months for irrigating crops. The upper Ganga Canal, the Madhya Ganga Canal, and the lower Ganga Canal, these three canals, they pretty much dry out Ganga by the time it reaches Kanpur. So the Madhya Ganga Canal comes out near Bijnur, or, uh, close to Delhi. Upper Ganga Canal, you saw the picture in, uh, in Ardhar. And the lower Ganga Canal, somewhere down between Bijnur and uh, Kanpur. So the river is pretty much dry. So the point was that uh, can we really look into other ways? Unless even if you go for a secondary or even tertiary treatment, no augmentation of flow, you cannot take bath in a treated sewage. So it has to have some uh, dilution capacity, uh, base flow. So that base flow cannot be maintained if you cut down, unless you cut down the irrigation diversion. There are the two things to do. Irrigation has to be uh, mechanized and uh, precision with a drip or a sprinkler or a, or a high efficiency irrigation. It's your land area can remain same, but you use a more precision technology to apply less amount of water, less wastage. And then you switch from surface water to groundwater irrigation. So that is done through, um, that is done through um, these canals, they can be uh, recharging the, especially in the monsoon months, they can recharge the aquifer. Then use the solar pumping system in summertime to pump the groundwater. So using combination of uh, groundwater and less amount of surface water, then releasing part of the water from the canals back into the Ganges and plus the appropriate treatment, that will really be needed. Otherwise, I don't see any other uh, uh, options. Amandeep. Thank you, sir. Now I would ask Mr. Amandeep Pohan to deliver the vote of thanks for this session. So let me first start by thanking our uh, Professor Mr. Chitaranjan Ray for taking his precious time and effort to deliver this webinar on riverbank filtration. Thank you, sir, so much. Uh, his, his contribution in the field of water filtration and hydrology is commendable and currently is working on land collector wells, which is one of the most recent developments in the field of water filtration and hydrology. He proves and demonstrates how engineers can leave their marks in variety of fields with their innovations. Thank you, sir. I am sure that whatever you have told us 
today will be of great use to us someday. Uh, I would also like to thank Professor Sanat Nalini Sau from the Department of Civil Engineering, NIT Raulkala, with specialization in water resource engineering and hydrology for gracing this event with her presence and for uh, her, her questions today, which were quite helpful for all the audience who has been viewing today's program. Now, I would also like to thank Professor Subhajit Mandal, the faculty advisor of Fresh Club and the chief pattern of CBNR, whose constant guiding presence has been and will be indispensable. I would also like to thank NIT Raulkala Student Activity Center for giving us this chance and such a constant encouragement to do such events, which help us grow and de develop. And of course, the webinar wouldn't be complete without its lovely audience. Thus, I would like to thank you all for attending it and making it a grand success. Last but not the least, I would also like to thank the organizing team for the event who had put tireless hours into making this event possible and seeing it through. Thank you all for turning up for the session. We hope that all, all of you are safe and doing well. We'll have more such interesting sessions in the coming days. And so stay tuned. And the video links of the previous sessions are provided in the description. You can go through there and don't forget to subscribe our channel and also do follow our Instagram and Facebook pages and kindly check our website, sestnitr.tech for more updates. Take care.